Hey everybody, welcome back to Conscientious Omnivore. My name is Powell. This channel is um, dedicated to really showing you how uh, by being conscious and conscientious about the foods that you choose to eat, you can greatly improve your health and well-being and um, positively impact the world around you. Uh, recently I posted a video um, which shows you the health benefits of adopting a healthy, vegan, whole food, plant-based diet. And I um, talked a lot about the leading causes of death, um, which is heart disease. I talked about other illnesses, cancer and stroke and a whole bunch of other things, and how all of these are greatly um, you know, helped by a, a healthy vegan diet. And in some cases, the illnesses can actually be reversed uh, altogether or prevented. And um, if you haven't watched that, I'm going to link it in the description of this video. So please feel free to check that out. And um, the presentation deck for that is also available in that link. So you can look through all the sources I cite. And uh, in fact, I encourage you to do that and read through the studies. Um, but anyway, with that said, uh, at the end of that video, I did mention that um, I presented this video at work for friends and coworkers. And um, basically, you know, I covered a section during my presentation which addresses a lot of the um, kind of like excuses that people have for not wanting to adopt or even try a, uh, a healthy vegan diet. And um, because there's quite a few uh, common excuses, I thought that it would be helpful to put together a separate um, video where I talk about those excuses specifically and kind of give you my take on what some of those are. Some of these are ones that I used myself um, before deciding to try um, a vegan diet. Uh, for my own um, self and um, yeah uh, hopefully you know give you some some uh, you know good answers to these excuses if you are thinking of them yourself and um, if you're vegan and you're watching these you know they, they may be amusing to you or maybe they'll give you a good answer to give somebody else when you're talking about the vegan diet to them and um, back it up with some you know science and some uh, some useful information so hopefully that's gonna be enjoyable for everybody to watch um, yeah, let's get into it. So, excuse number one most people come up with when you talk to them about a vegan diet is that, hey, you know, we're omnivores. We're meant to eat everything. That's how we're designed. And um, to this, what I like to point out is that, um, yes, people can digest meat. Um, so we often, you know, eat as omnivores, but that doesn't mean that that's uh, what is actually, you know, beneficial for us or the healthiest um, choice of what you can, uh, you know, eat. And um, to this point, I would also add that, you know, just because like, for example, in, in modern um, factory farming, they feed uh, cows all sorts of things that are not um, plant-based, like um, fish, blood, you know, they'll take away um, baby uh, calves and um, they won't even get their mother's milk. They'll get like a blood meal, protein um, mix uh, drink. Uh, that doesn't make them a carnivore any more than just the fact that you decide to eat a steak makes you a carnivore or uh, or an omnivore. Um, consider also that atherosclerosis, which is our leading uh, killer um, and, and contributes to all sorts of heart disease and heart attacks and everything else, uh, that is only um, found in herbivores. So basically, if you look at um, laboratory experiments that they've done, you can actually induce atherosclerosis in um, any number of herbivores if you feed them um, saturated fat and cholesterol. Uh, in a true um, carnivore, like dogs, cats, tigers, etc., lions, you cannot induce atherosclerosis regardless of how much saturated fat and cholesterol you feed those uh, um, test subjects. They will not get atherosclerosis. But if you do the same thing with an animal that is naturally um, an herbivore, like a a rabbit or you know something similar you can actually induce atherosclerosis so that is you know really a good indication the fact that people um, are dying from atherosclerosis and it's our leading killer that you know that really shows you that that's not uh, the optimal way that we should be eating um, another uh, common kind of response uh, to the vegan uh, diet is that uh, you know people will say well you know you're going on and on about saturated fat and cholesterol, it's, uh, you know, it's not nearly as unhealthy as you say, because look at all these studies that show that there's no significant um, link between um, ingested uh, cholesterol and um, saturated fat and um, high blood serum cholesterol. 
And uh, what um, people don't realize is that there are easy ways that you can kind of trick um, studies to show no significance. And uh, the first point here is that due to genetic differences, the, um, the baseline cholesterol of two people eating the identical amount of saturated fat and cholesterol could be wildly different. So for example, if you've kind of won the genetic lottery, you might be eating a really high level of saturated fat and cholesterol, and your um, blood serum cholesterol level might still be, you know, relatively low. Let's say it's, you know, like in the, you know, 180 range. Somebody else who's less genetically lucky, they may be eating the same amount of saturated fat and cholesterol as you, and they might be at 225. And um, what, uh, what happens is if you look at cross-sectional observational studies and don't look at baseline cholesterol measurements for different people, um, you can't show any uh, statistically significant difference between those two people, those two groups. Um, you can show like this guy's eating five eggs, this guy's eating two eggs, and the guy eating two eggs might have lower cholesterol, um, sorry, he might have higher cholesterol than the guy eating more um, eggs. And that's why you can't uh, rely on um, uh, cross-sectional um, observational studies to show differences between uh, cholesterol um, intake levels and blood serum cholesterol levels. And um, the the thing that scientists have also also shown is that if you take the any anybody and you measure their cholesterol at the baseline at the start of the experiment and then you increase the amount of saturated fat and cholesterol that they're eating their um, blood serum cholesterol levels will arise and the same thing is true if you decrease the amount of saturated fat and cholesterol that they're consuming their cholesterol levels will drop and um, this is so consistent that there's actually an equation that comes out to pretty much perfectly predict the change, the percentage change in their cholesterol levels based on the amount of saturated fat and cholesterol, um, either intake increase or decrease. Uh, and these relationships have been known for quite some time. So the, the, back in uh, 1979 and 1965 respectively, and they've been proven in hundreds of randomized clinical trials and controlled um, interventional, which means like feeding experiments. Um, over the course of those you know decades so this is not new information and it's been repeatedly proven hundreds and hundreds of times over with thousands and thousands of patients and um, what the meat egg and dairy industry you know keep doing is they will kind of keep designing studies based on cross-sectional um, you know design elements because they know that these studies are going to show people that like there's no correlation and that's exactly what they're doing. They want to sow doubt in people's minds so that the average Joe reading, you know, the newspapers and they see the new thing about, you know, go ahead and eat butter again, go ahead and eat eggs again. All they see is like, oh, you know, who knows? This doctor says this thing, that doctor says this thing, this study says this, that study says that. And then they're just left with this doubt that, that it's true. Um, they do this intentionally and the cigarette industry did the exact same thing with lung cancer back in the day. Uh, another common thing that people will point to when you talk to them about a vegan diet is like, oh, but you look at the Inuit, the, you know, the group of people living, you know, in, in the north, they were called the Eskimos previously. And um, so the, the Inuit, you know, are kind of held up as this um, paradigm of health. And they say, well, they were super healthy. They didn't get heart disease. And um, this myth actually started in 1975. There was a medical paper that simply just made the claim that uh, heart disease was unknown among uh, their people. And there was no corroborating evidence whatsoever that actually proved this. They had no tests, no evidence. They just, you know, they themselves didn't know about this disease, this disease or this illness. So they just assumed that it just wasn't there. Um, but subsequent actual studies of the people showed that they had terrible health. They had really short life expectancies and they had severe heart disease. And, and they even had mummies that they found. So these were um, bodies that had been preserved by you know, the dry and um, cold conditions, you know, in the ice. And um, they even found 4,000 year old mummies uh, where they showed that they had severe um, atherosclerosis, damage to the heart, they had terrible bone health. Um, so these people were extremely unhealthy. And, um, you know, this is again, 4,000 years ago. So this is way before anybody could claim that they were eating any kind of Western modern um, diet. And um, when they started adopting a more traditional kind of uh, Western diet, their life expectancies actually went up. So that really tells you something about how bad their, their diet is. You have to re remember that they're eating primarily, you know, animal products. So lots of, um, you know, blubber, 
so basically fat, you know, seals um, and other kind of meats and fish and things like that. Uh, the Maasai are a group of um, shepherding uh, uh, people living in Africa, and they are also similarly pointed out to. A lot of these come from the Weston uh, Price Foundation. Um, he was a dentist that, I think he was from Canada originally, but anyway, back in like the 30s, he started looking at why um, people eating a Western diet get like tooth decay and all these other kinds of things. He was a dentist and he traveled the world over and he studied a bunch of different populations and uh, the Maasai were one of the people that he studied. And what he noticed was that people eating their traditional kind of diets that were the pre, you know, industrialized Western kind of diet, they were all healthier from what he could see, bear in mind that he was a dentist, um, versus the, you know, the highly processed um often sugar-rich diets that the, the Western world was eating by that time. And, um, <clears throat> you know, sure enough, they didn't have, like, um, tooth decay and a bunch of other things like um, acne and some other things that he was looking for. But, uh, you know, you also have to bear in mind that when he was doing these studies, they didn't have the, uh, the modern kind of equipment and um, knowledge that, that's out there now for looking at things like heart disease. So a lot of times people will assume that the Maasai were really healthy because of the um, really propaganda that's still put out there today by the, um, uh, by the uh, Weston Price Foundation. And um, if you look at actual studies, when they went and um, followed up with uh, a group of 600 Maasai men in 1972, they showed that they had extensive atherosclerosis, which equaled that of old U.S. men. That's a direct quote from the, uh, from the study. And... Um, <clears throat> You know, this was despite them being exceptionally active. So they were they were 175 percent as active as the U.S. Uh, counterparts, like group for age, and they were only eating meat once uh, or f maybe up to five times a month. So it's not like they were eating a ton of meat, but they did eat a lot of dairy. So the Maasai, you have to realize, they shepherd around um, large groups of animals, and then they they uh, eat the dairy from them, and also they drink blood from the animals. That makes up the majority of their diet. So, uh, you know, they, they were far from being healthy when you actually looked at them. And uh, their BMI was also on the very low end of normal. So they weren't quite like starved yet, but they were not far away from that. Um, and they were only eating about 50 to 70% of their recommended calorie intake on a daily basis. So, you know, the fact that, um, you know, they were fit and um, not overweight was really just the fact that they had very little to eat. Um, this one is really kind of like the classic, uh, excuse that people will give you. They say, oh, but I, you know, I need, I need protein or the protein you get from plants is not good. Um, it's incomplete. You're missing, you know, some of the nine essential, um, amino acids. Uh, they're not as well absorbed. So, you know, eating protein from, you know, beans, legumes, nuts, oatmeal, rice, whatever, it's not as good as eating it from meat or, or eggs or dairy. Um, if you actually look at the facts, you will see that uh, all of these are just complete distortions or lies, and um, the opposite is true. So you can see the left-hand side, this comes from, um, I have links for all of this uh, stuff. I put in a number of links. I'm going to kind of keep this a little bit short because maybe I'll make a whole separate video about just protein. But um, really what you can you know see is just start looking at the stuff, and what you see is the reality column. The... Um, uh, plant proteins are um, uh, containing all of the essential amino acids. The reason why people will tell you is that they're incomplete is because in plant foods, even though they do contain all the nine essential um, amino acids, they have them in differing amounts to uh, meat. In meat, they're roughly all like, like one to one. So <clears throat> they're all in equal proportions. Whereas in plants, certain plant foods have like high levels of one particular amino acid and they might have low levels of another, but then if you eat another food, um, that might be the opposite way around. And it, there used to be this myth called um, having to, uh, what was it called? Um, like basically like, like complementary um, plant proteins. So you'd have to eat like rice and beans together and all this kind of stuff. Otherwise, you know, if you weren't careful, you were gonna get an imbalance and not get all your um, uh, amino acids that you needed the essential amino acids. But what you see here is that um, in practice, this is just impossible. There's like, um, you know, it, like theoretically, you could make some kind of like really imbalanced, um, you know, protein profile for yourself by choosing like very specific like um, plants to eat and nothing but those. 
uh, but it, in practice is is virtually impossible. You cannot become protein deficient if you're eating enough calories. And uh, and if you look at like what most people actually eat, <clears throat> either through tradition, excuse me, <clears throat> either through tradition, um, or uh, just you know from like a practical standpoint they are getting those like complementary proteins by default so for example like um you know beans and rice tend to go together or like people will eat hummus with bread those um, protein uh, profiles balance each other out completely another thing is that they're not as readily avail available that's also been shown to be false um, they also sometimes will point to um, protein analysis uh, studies that were done on like rats and um, that's been shown to be false they don't uh, correlate back to uh, human um, studies. Uh, that's actually a separate topic for a separate video, but a lot of times what you find is when you see animal studies, you cannot actually properly take those lessons learned and apply them to human um, cases. And that's a really good reason why um, most vegans are actually against, so strongly against, um, animal testing. So uh, what you find in those um, studies do not correlate back to human um, you know, uh, examples and application. So anyway, I mean, this, this is a big topic. I'm going to kind of leave it at that, but read through the, um, the links that I have in the slides here. And, uh, you know, it's really easy to see that, uh, that you can get all of the protein needs that you, that you have on a, uh, vegan diet, eating whole plant foods. The other thing that you know, I will say about protein in general is that a lot of people have very strong misconceptions about the macronutrients, protein, fat, and, and carbohydrates. Um, because of all the really successful propaganda from the Atkins and, you know, similar kind of crowds, people assume that certain foods are one or the other of the macronutrients. They will look at something like oatmeal and they will think, oh, it's carbos, it's carbohydrates, it's just carbs. And that's actually in, totally incorrect. Um, all plants are actually all three macronutrients. Now, are you know you can you can look at the balance. So it might be more carbohydrates than say protein, or more carbohydrates than fat. But they do all have the, all the macronutrients. So a banana does have fat in it. It's just very little. A banana does have protein in it. It's just very little. But throughout the course of the day, all of the things you're eating, they all kind of add up. And if you start looking at something like even like like rice, um, you know, and oatmeal, which most people would just see as carbs, you'll see a lot of people incorrectly say, oh, they're just eating sugar. And um, that couldn't be further from the truth. You're actually ingesting quite a bit of protein um, from those things, uh, as well as, you know, other similar things. I mean, you look at an avocado, there's a lot of fat in there, but it does still have some carbohydrates. It does still have, um, you know, some uh, protein. So yeah, definitely bear those things in mind. Um, classic, <laughs> the next one here is the vitamin B12. Uh, favorite go-to, this used to be my favorite go-to of, of why I would never adopt a vegan diet. Um, you know, you can't get B12 from plant sources. And this is somewhat true, uh, but it's actually kind of a tricky one. And here's why. Um, B12 is produced by bacteria that's found in uh, in dirt, basically. So it, you, you find this in the soil itself and also in untreated groundwater um, because it seeps through the dirt and uh, picks up the, the B12 produced by these bacteria. And um, the funny thing is that um, before we treated our water, uh, you know, another thing people will tell you is like, it's so unnatural. Like, why would you have to get B12 from a, you know, pharmaceutical source when, you know, that's why you shouldn't be a vegan because it's not natural. Well, you know, bear in mind that years and years ago, when people were just drinking out of streams, drinking out of lakes, drinking out of ponds, drinking out of well water, um, you know, sources, they were getting all the vitamin B12 they needed, because if you drink about three liters of pond water, you're getting enough B12 for your daily requirement. So, you know, three liters of water is like less than a, a gallon. Four or four liters is, is about a gallon of water. For an adult-sized male, they recommend you to drink about a gallon of water a day. So, you know, you could easily get that, but again, you have to balance the risk. You know, do you want to be drinking untreated, like, you know, well water? Maybe not. Do you want to drink it out of a pond? Probably not. It, you know, you're almost certainly going to be picking up some other kind of, um, you know, bacteria or something that you don't want to get, and you might end up with diarrhea or something else. Um, so, 
you know, was it there in the in the past? Yes. And um, you know, if you're choosing to eat animal products because of the B12, what you have to realize is that because of the factory farming conditions, that 90 whatever percent of the meat that's produced is you know um, grown in, the animals themselves don't get enough B12 from natural sources. See, in the wild, like um, an animal would be grazing or like eating stuff off the floor, off the dirt, they would be getting B12 from the dirt that they're ingesting with the little bits of grass and plants and whatever else that they're eating. But because they're confined in these spaces, they're standing on concrete, they don't even get to see grass, they don't even get to go outside in a field ever in their life sometimes, they have to actually be supplemented with B12 um, because they would be unhealthy if they didn't get it. And so what happens is, if you look at like the largest supply of B12, it's going to animal um, agriculture. And uh, you're basically choosing to get your B12 through the filter of the animal instead of just taking it yourself in a form of a pill or an injection or, you know, a spray. And, um, you know, you really should bear that in mind that it's like you're getting all the negative things associated with the animal products that I mentioned in the other video. And you're doing that just so you can get B12, which you could easily just take as a um, either like a chewable tablet or a spray or an injection. And a lot of times people will tell you like, oh, it's an injection. It doesn't have to be an injection. That's just something that people choose to do for, I guess, convenience. Some people don't want to have to take like a daily, um, you know, chewable tablet or a spray. The other thing you can bear in mind, though, is that um, a lot of vegan foods now have the B12 added. So you can get your soy milks, your um, tofus, your yogurts, you know, vegan cheeses, etc. A lot of these have B12 added. Um, and in fact, in the U.S., a lot of like uh, wheat products, so flour and things like that, are also often, um, you know, supplemented with uh, with vitamin B12. So it depends on the products. You have to go look, but uh, it's certainly possible to get um, fortified foods that already contain B12, and then you don't even need to worry about taking any kind of pills or or uh, injections. Um, you know, here this last statistic. This is an interesting one that. You know, vegans only make up 1% of the USA's uh, population, but over 20% of people over age 60 are shown to be marginally um, deficient uh, in B12. So it's certainly not a vegan problem. There are many, many people in uh, the modern world that are um, B12 deficient, and that's why it's recommended that everybody take B12. And obviously we recommend that you get that uh, as vegans. Um, you know, through either uh, supplement or fortified foods. Another classic, you know, the Got Milk commercials, they, they work really well. Everybody believes that you need milk for um, strong bones. So they say, you know, I can't go vegan because I need strong bones. Consider that, um, you know, in this study, they had over 106,000 people. They followed them for 20 years. And what they showed was that um, uh, they had increased rates of um, death for both men and women and they had increased rates of hip fractures for the women in those uh, groups drinking the most milk. And in fact, for the women, the rate of death for those drinking three or more glasses of milk a day, they were almost twice as high as for the people only drinking one glass a day. Um, for men, the hip fracture rate was unchanged. As I said, they only had the higher death rate, but for both of the sexes, so men and women, they had higher rates of cancer, cardiovascular disease, and biomarkers of um, oxidative stress and inflama inflammation. All of those were higher for the um, people drinking more milk. Um, consumption of, of fermented dairy products, so this is like your yogurts and cheeses, uh, did seem to offer some protection against fractures, um, which was interesting, but, uh, but they did still correlate positively with oxidative stress and inflammation. The lesson here is that you can get all the calcium you need from plants, dark leafy green vegetables, um, beans, chickpeas, etc. you know, eating hummus, um, you can get plenty of calcium um, if you're really concerned. Again, it's something that's easy to supplement or get foods fortified with calcium. Some of the um, things like tofu, um, you know, or milks or cheeses or, or um, vegan yogurts, etc. <clears throat> this is probably my favorite uh, excuse when they tell you, people will say, well, I can't, I can't be vegan because I'm poor. I don't have money. Um, you know, vegan food is really expensive. Um, there are actually studies on this and, uh, you know, several that I've, I've pulled together here, you can see that you can save up to like $1,200 a year on your food costs by going vegan. 
um, they have the statistics of why and, and they back it up with actual figures. But um, it's quite impressive how much cheaper it is. I can attest to this from my own personal food bill. I definitely spend less money now. Meat and dairy are really expensive. And if you want to buy organic versions of those things, they're like ridiculously expensive. Um, processed vegan junk food can be expensive, um, you know, relative to like whole foods for sure. Um, and even relative to animal foods, sometimes they can be expensive. But just think of the cheapest things you can buy. What do most poor people in the world eat? They eat rice, beans, potatoes, pasta, corn. These are like the cheapest things you can get. Um, can you find some, you know, fruits and veggies, fruits and veggies that are expensive? Yes, you can. But in general, you just save tons and tons of money by not buying animal products. Um, I often, you know, look at like, you know, okay, mangoes. Okay, those are kind of expensive. Uh, but then I look at the price of meat and compared to that, the mangoes are still cheap. So again, you have to kind of like think of the poorest people that you know in the world and what are they eating? They're eating pri primarily vegan foods. So, um, you know, we're getting to the end here. This is the last excuse, but uh, a lot of times people will, will come at you and they'll say, yeah, but you know, I'm pregnant. I can't, I can't go on a vegan diet or well, I don't want my children eating a vegan diet or, oh, you know, what if my baby's not going to grow and not going to develop and all this kind of stuff, um, or I'm an athlete. Uh, please consider this quote. I'm going to read it for you. Um, this comes from the American Dietetics Association. It is the position of the American Dietetic Association that appropriately planned vegetarian diets, including total vegetarian or vegan diets, are healthful, nutritionally adequate, and may provide health benefits in the prevention and treatment of certain diseases. Well-planned vegetarian diets are appropriate for individuals during all stages of the life cycle, um, including pregnancy, lactation, infancy, childhood, and adolescence, and for athletes. So let that sink in. They are telling you it is safe and good and, you know, advantageous to prevent diseases and treat certain diseases to be vegan. Um, this organization is the U.S.'s largest organization of food and nutrition professionals. They have over 100,000 credentialed practitioners. So the next time somebody, you know, really tries to say to you, um, you know, that veganism is, is unhealthy or, you know, it's dangerous or whatever, please just bear that in mind that um, the science shows that it can really help you with a lot of um, illnesses, a lot of um, different kinds of uh, illnesses can be prevented or treated with it and it's really just you know something that will make you feel good and uh, hopefully live a healthier and happier life so yeah I hope you enjoyed those and um, you know I think there's a lot of other excuses that we can go through I'll probably make another video at some point later but uh, these were the ones that I covered for my coworkers when I when I did this presentation a while back and um, these are actually very similar to my own excuses I had, um, you know, going back when, uh, you know, before I decided to give veganism a shot and saw kind of how actually powerful it is and um, saw my own personal health benefits. I'll be posting a video about that as well, um, separate to this, but, uh, but I didn't want to make this too much of a personal kind of, um, you know, anecdotal kind of thing. This is actually just the science there is there to, to show that, um, you know, it's a legit uh, diet. So I'll sum it up here. Um, hope everybody gives it a shot. I think, you know, if you try veganism for three, four weeks, I, I just guarantee you'll feel better. Um, you're going to notice some positive effects in your life. And um, yeah, be smart about it. Do some research. Make sure you get enough calories. That's like the number one mistake people try is they, uh, they go vegan. They just don't know what to eat. They're not e eating enough calories and they think like you have to live off of salads and like, you know, lettuce and peppers and, and like kale, I mean, and broccoli or something. That's not going to give you enough calories. You need to eat enough. And uh, if you do that, you're going to be you know feeling great. And um, yeah, hopefully if you have any questions, let me know. I'm happy to help out as much as I can. There are really great websites and resources you can go to um, to, you know, get you started on your journey. So hopefully that's good. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please remember to subscribe and um, share this video. And um, yeah, see you in the next one. Thanks. Bye.